Just a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the blessings of obedience. And I think this morning's sermon is one that is very important as well as we talk about the demands of repentance. Now, today in particular, I want to talk about two different subjects that really are very, very important. And they're subjects that are sometimes very difficult to not so much understand, but to put into practice. And that's repentance. I want you to think with me this morning about the subject of repentance, and that's difficult, a difficult command given by God. And I think that the Bible attests to that fact, that repentance is something that is not always easy. And as we think about this for a moment, repentance involves the very mind and the emotions of mankind. And that's something that we find as being difficult to put into practice. Repent or change your mind about a past life, but be willing to change direction for the future. And that's tough. Now that can affect the non-Christian and the Christian, right? I mean, many people never come to Christ, never obey the the gospel of Christ because it's so difficult to repent, to turn away from their old ways. And there are those who become Christians who later err or stray from the path because they find it difficult to get right with God because repentance is so tough. It's not easy to repent of sin. Now tonight... We hope that you'll tune in back with us at 5 o'clock as we'll talk about another subject called guilt. Once a person does repent of his past sins, is baptized for the remission of his sins, he has this realization that all of his sins are now been washed away. They're now gone. Now that's good news that's found in the gospel, isn't it? And we also know this to be true, that when Jesus died on the cross, not only did he take away the sin debt, but that cross accomplishes something else, and it removes the guilt, doesn't it? And that's what we want to talk about even tonight. If we have been forgiven of our past sins, God says, because of the cross, you don't have to be guilty anymore. You don't have to feel that guilt anymore and you can put that guilt now behind you. So remember the word justified? We studied it before. Just if I had never sinned, we've talked about it many times, we can live guilt-free in Christ. Did you know that? We can. And yet repentance is something that is very hard for us to do Guilt is something, at least being guiltless, is something hard to, for us to accept. We cling to guilt, that is, theoretically, doctrinally, theologically, where we understand my sins are forgiven in Christ, but oh, to let that go. Sort of like the man who said, I prayed to God 1,000 times to forgive me of the same sin. Well, did you repent? Yes, I repented. Well, don't ask him anymore to forgive you if you repented. Thank him for forgiving you. It's behind you. So God does want us to live with guilt or to live without guilt. And the remedy is the cross of Christ. And so that's tonight at 5 o'clock, and I hope that you'll be here or be able to watch online for that particular message. But right now, let's think about this word repentance. Just from our study in this particular passage, if someone's going to be right with God, he must follow the pathway of repentance or he must be willing to repent of his past. And what we learn this morning about repentance from this passage is that we first learn that repentance is something that must be proclaimed. People need to hear the message, don't they? Repentance must be proclaimed or it must be preached. There in his message, look at verse 2, 
John the Baptist, he was saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent of what? Verse 6. They came to be baptized, confessing their sins. So we learned that we're to repent of sins, right? What are sins? Well, we find that sins are transgressions against the law of God. Sin is that which is an offense against a holy God. And God said, you desire forgiveness, understand it comes through repentance. And that's the message that John the baptizer was preaching. So we often mention this world is still full of problems. Nothing has gone away, it seems. Fightings within, fightings without, or wars without. There are a lot of problems. And there are multitudes of people who say, I've, I've got the answer to the problems that we face. The philosopher, he might say, let me think about the problem, right? <laughs> That's what he spends his life doing just that, thinking about how to solve the problem. How to figure out the problem is what the philosopher does. On the other hand, it's the psychologist who says, you're the problem. And he makes a lot of money saying that you're the problem, doesn't he? Convincing everybody that they are the problem. And then there's the philanthropist who says, let me minimize the problem. He says, but you know, he's a giver. And he's trying to minimize the problem. The politician might say, let me fix the problem. Put me in office and I will take care of it for you. Now the preacher says, that is the gospel preachers, he says, let me tell you what God says you must do. Let me tell you what God says is the problem. And what God says is the solution to the problem. If a man is going to be true to God when he preaches, he will preach the message of repentance and that is going to be a common characteristic that you should find in all gospel preachers. Now, I want us to consider a few preachers of the New Testament and the message that was declared of these preachers. For example, the two most prominent preachers during the first century, at least during the time of the first century church, was Peter and Paul. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, you're familiar with that as Peter brought his message to the conclusion that the crowd thundered, men and brethren, what must we do? Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you. That was a part of the apostle's message. As a matter of fact, in Acts chapter 8, when he was speaking to a man who had already become a Christian, whose heart was not right with God, who heard, he said, here's what you need to do. Right? Here's what you need to do. You need to repent. So whether it be the non-Christian who has sinned, or a child of God, as we read in Acts chapter 8, in sin, the message is always the same. Repent. And then we consider the great apostle Paul. Look at Acts chapter 17. We have heard many messages preached on this sermon uh, from Acts 17 when, Peter, when Paul stood at Mars Hill and began preaching to the Athenians. In verses 30 and 31, he says, In the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in that which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he the, by whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he had raised him from the dead. Now, why did Peter and Paul and the other evangelists, the apostles of the first century, preach that message? Because it was the message of the Lord. When Jesus lived upon this earth, he preached. In Luke 13, 3, he says, I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Jesus is saying no one guilty of sin can go to heaven unless he travels the pathway of repentance. 
And I mention that to say this. John the baptizer is in good company when he preaches about repentance, isn't he? That's right. He is just preaching the same message of his Lord. He is preaching the same message that Peter and Paul taught as well. And the message of repentance. And because of that, I better be in that same company, shouldn't I? That's right. If I'm going to be faithful to the Lord, you better be in that company as well. Calling upon friends, calling upon family, calling upon neighbors to repent if you're going to get right with God. Now, what is repentance? Well, that's a good question. That's really the heart of the message this morning. We want to know what it is because if we don't understand it, then we cannot be obedient to the very message of repentance. Repentance demands change. Oh, and people do not like change. Oh, they like it in their pocket maybe, right? But they don't like to change. Repentance demands changes. Just put that down. Repentance is concerned about changes. It's the change of mind brought about a godly sorrow that results in a transformation of a person's life. Where does repentance begin? Well, it begins in the mind, doesn't it? A person who comes forward confessing Christ as the Son of God, ready to be baptized, or or if he's a scriptural candidate for baptism, he is one who has repented, and he took And that took place in his mind first off. A change of mind. So it's not just being sorry for sin or feeling bad about sin, but a willingness and a desire to leave that sin behind. Change your way of thinking. And so in 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 10, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Now, godly sorrow will lead one to repentance. There were two disciples of our Lord who sinned against Jesus uh, around the time of his crucifixion, and you know who they are. Peter was one of them. Peter said that he would never deny the Lord, but yet he denied him three times. Judas Iscariot betrayed the Lord. Neither of these two men were happy with what they had done. Both of them were sorrowful about their actions. But I'm convinced that only one repented, and that was Simon Peter. He was the only one that repented. He repented with godly sorrow, and Jesus knew that. In Mark 16, verse 7, he's among the first that Jesus would ask to see and desired to be informed about his resurrection. Jesus knew what Peter had done in sinning against him. But Jesus also knew about his repentance, didn't he? And Jesus gave him another opportunity because Peter was willing to travel that pathway of repentance. Then look in Matthew 21 and verse 28. And remember the parable that Jesus gives us in connection to repentance. In verse 28 of Matthew 21, beginning, he says, But what think ye? A certain man had two sons. And he came to the first, and he said, Son, go work today with me in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he repented. I want you to notice the next two words. And went. And he came to the second and said, likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Who repented? The first one. The first one said, I will not go, but then changed his mind and went. That's what repentance is. It is the changing of mind that results in the change of life, action, attitude as a result. Someone says, well, that's a tough thing to do. Oh, it's the most difficult of all of God's commands. 
You see, if a person really is sincere and honest, and I join those two words together, if a person's sincere and honest, he'll have no problem believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Is that really a difficulty if we are sincere and honest? No. Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. That sincere, honest person then will have no problem confessing that wonderful truth that he will desire to confess that truth. I will say to someone who is thinking about being baptized, don't you be ashamed of confessing Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Don't be ashamed. I believe that any time a person is ready to obey the gospel of Christ, he be in the middle of the night, even though he needs to call someone and say, I've got to do this, I want to be ready to take that call. I want to be the one. And I'll be there to help that person. And you would too. Beyond, but on the other hand, I would not want to hear any person say, well, I want to be baptized, but not in front of everybody. Well, that's kind of tough, isn't it? Now, I leave that to God to judge the heart of that person. I mean, but to let me tell you something here, Jesus died publicly, didn't he? So why wouldn't you want to then address that very fact of confessing your sins and your, based upon your repentance and let it be known that you are becoming a child of God through your baptism? You see, a sincere, honest person will have no problem with that. And they will let it be known. And to get a person to be baptized in water, if that person is sincere and honest, shouldn't be difficult at all. It is just not that difficult thing to do. When someone comes to me questioning their past and saying, you know, I was baptized at one time, but I'm just not sure if I was baptized for the right reason. Because, You know, I didn't fully understand what it means to be baptized for the remission of sin. I didn't know enough then. Well, or I was at a certain age that I did not fully comprehend, but I think that I I, I must, I'm more sure about it now. The first thing I say, let's sit down for a moment. Let's open up and see what what God says. And then if at that point you still feel like you need to make that change or that, that decision, let's remove all doubt. Let's remove all doubt. That's what's important. I don't want anybody to feel like that they might have obeyed the gospel too soon or maybe didn't fully understand and then to come back later and say, I, don't fully, I didn't fully understand, or there might have been a chance I didn't fully understand. And then to then go on with that doubt. I don't want that to happen. So repentance must be proclaimed. That's the first thing we learn here in Matthew 3. Now the second thing we learn in Matthew 3 about repentance is that it must be produced. Look at verse 7 of Matthew 3. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. John the baptizer is preaching, and he's preaching to a generation of vipers, right? O ye generation of vipers. What are you doing here? He's asking them. He's questioning them. Why are all you people over here, he asks. In verse 8, he says what? You need to bring forth, therefore, fruits, meat for repentance. He's saying you're not sincere about this. You're not ready to make this a, a necessary change. In other words, John the baptizer says that if it's not from the heart, it's not genuine repentance. Whatever you do, is not acceptable to God. Now, there could be those who have similar attitudes even today. There are those who want to be saved despite their sin by remaining in their sin. I don't believe that their heart is genuine. 
their repentance would not be genuine as well. But I'm sure that there are people like that. They think that God is so loving and so gracious and kind that there's no way that he would allow anyone to go to hell. And so, but there is nothing therefore required on my part, they might think, because God loves me this anyway. That's the message that resonates with a whole lot of people. But again, we have to re- remember that repentance is a change of mind. I've made up my mind. Somebody says, well, what about out there in the future at some point when I sin against God? That likely might happen. But here's what's important. God deals with today. God knows all things, doesn't he? He knows what I will do in the future, but he doesn't prejudge me based on something that I might do in the future that is not in harmony with his will. He is interested in where I am today. And so some want to be be saved by remaining in their sin without traveling this pathway of repentance. Some want to be saved by ritualism. That is, just by performing a certain act or some acts or by so doing that God will be pleased with that. But I believe that the heart is still not in the right place, is it? We sometimes call this legalism and allows no room whatsoever for repentance. Those Pharisees were guilty of some of this. Just perform certain acts and that's all that's necessary regardless of having a penitent heart. Now I believe that these Pharisees came to Jesus or came to John to be baptized. But he knew them. And that's why he said, (coughs) bring forth fruits of repentance. But they had rejected the message of John the baptizer because in Matthew 21, 25, listen to what Jesus said. He said, the baptism of John, whence was it? From heaven or from men? And they reasoned with themselves saying, well, if we say from heaven, he's going to say unto us, why did you not believe in him? But if we shall say of men, we fear the people. For all hold John as a prophet. Their heart wasn't in the right place. So they rejected John. They didn't accept his message. Does baptism save? Well, if you have studied your Bible, then you know that it does. And we can quote the passages. But does baptism alone save? No, no, nothing alone saves. Faith alone, no. Grace alone, no. Confession alone, no. Repentance alone, no. Faith, well, we already said that. Penitent believers can be baptized, but the lack of going through the process or just being there in the water without repentance, that does nothing, nothing at all. But then there are those who think that they can be saved by some other means than the pathway of repentance. I'll show you an example of this right here in our text. Look at verse 9 of Matthew 3. Look at verse 9. Let's go back. Look at verse 9. Here's an example. John says, And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Oh, but we are Abraham's children now, all right? Which they they brought that up over and over again to the Lord. How can we be condemned if we are Abraham's children, is what they're trying to say. John said, right before Jesus got to preaching, he said that God would raise up from these stones the children of Abraham if that's what he wants. No. You see, God demands repentance. This change of mind, repentance must be proclaimed. John says repentance must be produced. Show forth the fruits. Meet. For repentance. And here's the third point. Repentance must be the primary. 
You see, repentance must be primary and that it must be primary, a primary focus in our lives. Well, is that so true? Well, remember what John said there in verse 2? Here's the message. Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Isn't it a true principle that you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven without repentance? Yes, that's true. You cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven without first repentance. That should be the primary focus. We know that all the other steps have to go in as well. But repentance should be the primary focus. To be saved, you have to be in the kingdom, and you can't get into the kingdom without repentance. You read Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the the chapters of the Sermon on the Mount, which is a great treatise on Christian living, kingdom living, and nobody can live that life that is recorded there in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 unless you first do what? Repent of your past. Repent. But then also you cannot produce good fruit, good works, unless you repent. Look at verse 10. For, and now also the axe is laid into the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Matthew 3.10. He's talking about those who are impenitent and those, and so one cannot produce good fruit unless he repents. That, then finally, you, you don't want to face the judgment unless you repent. Look at verses 11 and 12 of Matthew 3. John says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I whose shoes I am not worthy to even bear, he shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire, whose fan, is on his, uh, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. What is he talking about? That the one who comes after me is going to baptize with fire. Someone said, well, he's talking about Pentecost. No, no, no. Verse 12 explains it, doesn't it? He's talking about the judgment. Yes, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit would come upon the apostles. That's true. Then he would also bring fire from heaven. That's judgment. And Jesus talked about that. And so did the apostles in their preaching and teaching throughout their lives. And Jesus talked about that, the, my friends, We do not want to face the judgment unless we have repented. Back in Acts 17 and verse 30. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Why? Because he had appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he had given assurance unto all men, in that he had raised him from the dead. What's the problem? Simply stated, the problem is sin. What's the solution? Simply stated, repentance. Repentance. There's a lot that repentance demands, doesn't it? But that's the crux of the matter. God demands repentance. And so in Acts 19, you find something very interesting about the baptism in John in this exchange. Because he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? Acts 19, 3 and 4. And they said unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him who, which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Jesus. What was, what was John doing? He was pointing to Jesus. He was pointing to Jesus. And so today, in order for one to be saved, he has to believe on Jesus, and he still has to repent. Believe on Jesus, 
repent of sin, and be baptized in a watery grave for the remission of sins. That's the message of Christ. Baptism is a scriptural act, but it is preceded by a scriptural attitude, and that is the attitude of repentance. What matters right now, my friend, is the decision that you have to make. A decision that you have to make right at this moment. That if you're not a child of God, not a Christian, what is important is that you make a decision right now in your mind that having believed that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, thinking, Jesus, I do believe that and I made a decision, I've changed my mind about some things that I used to do. I'm changing my mind. I'm not going to do those anymore. I'm going to follow Christ. And following Christ means that if you're willing, based upon that repentance, to step out, come down this aisle to be baptized with him. Or Facebook Live, give me a call. And let's get this taken care of now. Following Christ means you have to be willing And for the child of God, we continue to repent of past sins, don't we? How often do we pray, Lord, I've done wrong and I I repent of that? Just changed my mind? I hope you just didn't change your mind. I hope that you change your ways. Based upon changing your heart, your mind. How, I mean, if I continue living in rebellion against God day after day after day, means I am not repenting. If my sin doesn't bother me, am I not repenting of it? Repentance says I have changed my mind, which results in the change of action. Maybe somebody here is a child of God. Maybe you're listening as a child of God. And you're saying, I'm changing my mind, turning back toward Christ to follow him. I hope all of us will think that way. And maybe somebody will respond to the invitation.